This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So what I'm going to try to do uh, uh, quickly in the next 10 or 15 minutes is talk about how we stage the vascular anatomy in patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia and why we need a new approach. So I think what we are all, what we all do in clinical practice, but what we're trying to now formulate in a more uh, cohesive fashion is how we make decisions around these patients. And there's really three axes around which we do this. The first, of course, is to assess the overall patients, their risk for any procedure we do, uh, their ability to get through an anesthetic, and their survivability, their survival, predicted survival. And for that, we have lots of risk assessment tools that we're not talking about today on the patient level, uh, risk scores, and, and cardiac evaluation. The second that Alex just went through is then we stage the limb. The first thing we want to know is, is the limb salvageable at all? Are we likely to get a walkable foot? And if so, how severe is the threat to the limb based on wound, ischemia, and infection? And then the third piece, if there is significant ischemia, is how we then describe and stage the vascular anatomy so that we can try to tailor the right approach for the right patient at the right time to save the foot with the least trauma to the patient. That's the goal. I think those of us who do vascular intervention in chronic limb-threatening patients realize how challenging this can be to achieve that goal. Even though we have lots of tools, the patients present at the end stage of atherosclerotic peripheral disease. Multi-level disease in, in this is common, which is a, actually a bigger challenge for endovascular than for surgery. Long segment disease and chronic occlusions are common in, in cr critical limb ischemia. Tibial disease is also very common, and despite the fact that we've made lots of gains, um, tibial disease is a major problem, both in terms of technical uh, success, but also durability of, of reconstruction. And many of these patients have extensive calcification. This is a problem for both open and endovascular, uh, and it's frequently now being seen more and more because of this epidemiology of diabetes and renal disease. Up to a third of patients don't have a vein, a good vein that we, that we can use. These are, this is an everyday challenge. But one of the things that, that many uh, interventionalists pr particularly may not be thinking about is what it takes to actually get all the way to the end zone here. So the challenges of advanced tissue loss means we have to support the healing of foot reconstructions, such as a TMA, which may take months to stabilize. Large defects on the foot, we know on average, may take uh, you know, upwards of four to six months to completely close. And then all these comorbidities, the diabetes, the renal failure, the poor nutrition, the edema, uh, all of these things just slow wound healing down. So these wounds don't resolve that quickly, and we want that perfusion to maintain at an optimal state the whole time. On top of all this, we've got the patient's comorbidities, which clearly affects bigger procedures more. And, and the last thing I would say is about durability. And durability matters for some patients more than others, but we do know that up to 80% of diabetic foot ulcers will recur within a year, even though they've healed the first time. So you're looking at the same foot with another problem, and you're wondering again what's going on with perfusion. And although CLI is a bad disease, we've learned from many studies that at least 60 to 70 percent of these patients will survive for two years. So they come back, and they come back with another problem. What are the technical goals that we're trying to achieve? I think particularly for patients with the more advanced stages of Wi-Fi, with advanced tissue loss, and with infection, we know we need to get a lot of oxygenated blood down there. We would like to restore inline flow to the ankle and foot. In some cases, we have to make a determination of whether or not this can be staged. Can we, can we do part of the revascularization? Can we deal with the inflow only first? Do we have to get it all there at one time? And we, in, in, in some cases, we may do a stage reconstruction and monitor closely. 
Bottom line is for aortoiliac disease, because the results are quite good and the disease patterns are favorable, we're going to be treating that with endovascular intervention almost all the time unless it's a very severe or there's been previous endovascular failures. But below the inguinal ligament, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And that's where we have a problem with the anatomic staging that we need. How are we going to decide what's the best first approach? There's a lot of heterogeneity in the patterns of disease and in the burden. And there's a continuously evolving role for endovascular techniques versus bypass. So we need a system that allows us to compare things adequately so that we can make sense. And that system has to be integrated over the whole limb. It can't be segment by segment because these patients have disease in more than one segment. In fact, uh, this is a really good study that was done a number of years ago from the folks out in Colorado, um, and there have been some others that have looked at the distribution of lesions, and not surprisingly, if you look at CLI patients, and particularly diabetics with CLI, you will see that uh, the, the great majority of these patients have critical lesions in more than one segment, and particularly in diabetes, there's a high prevalence of disease below the knee. So it would be typical at least 50% of patients will have significant disease in more than one segment. Now, that's a problem because our current anatomic schemes don't really help us figure out what we're supposed to do. We have some schemes out there, such as the Bollinger scheme, which attempts to capture all of the burden of atherosclerosis in the limb in an additive fashion. It's a pretty complex system that you can use on an angiogram. You get a summed score. It turns out that that summed score is associated with things like overall mortality. Um, but uh, it also includes, for example, lesions in parallel tibial arteries that may not even be your target vessel. So it's really, a, it captures all atherosclerosis, but it doesn't really help you figure out clinical decision making. There's a, there are other runoff scores, like the SVS runoff score. It's been re reasonably useful to look at the outcomes of bypass surgery. It's really not been very well used, used in endovascular intervention. And then we have the system that most of us are most familiar with, which is the TASC system, which is an interesting system that I think has its most use in sort of focusing on the outcomes for a specific lesion and a specific device in a specific location. For example, an SFA lesion or atibial lesion, but it doesn't address what we're treating in CLI, which is combined and multi-level disease. It doesn't integrate the whole path of revascularization. So uh, in real life, particularly for critical limb ischemia, which in contrast to claudication is usually not a single segment disease, it really has limited utility. So here's an example of a typical uh, CLI patient. Actually, this patient presented on the right side, you can see the SFA is open. I'm sorry about the cutoff, but there's an occlusion above the knee. The uh, entire popliteal artery is out, and then there's tibial disease as well uh, going down the leg. So this is a, an SFA and popliteal TP trunk occlusion with some tibial disease. It's a pretty typical situation uh, for a CLI patient. In fact, this is not easily actually addressed by the TASC system because it doesn't integrate the whole scheme. So you could look at the SFA, then you could look at the tibial, and you can try to figure out, well, what are they really telling me to do? Um, in fact, if you look at lesion severity and complexity across the spectrum of CLI, it has a pretty big effect, not surprisingly, more so on endovascular intervention, because with bypass surgery with a good conduit, we're going around all of it. But with tibial disease, uh, with, I'm sorry, with endovascular treatment, you can see here that it, it makes a big impact. So here's a review from New York of, of a large number of interventions. And you can see as the number of levels of disease goes up, not surprisingly, the patency rates and the outcomes go down. And tibial interventions were far more common in this population uh, in the setting of critical limb ischemia than with claudication. So critical limb ischemia patients present a different challenge because of the multi-levels of disease in additive fashion. Uh, here was another, a, another look at the impact, particularly of below the knee disease. So we've had a lot of technology that's been developed and I think things are clearly improving. A lot of focus in the femoral popliteal system, but below the knee we still have a lot of challenges. And if we look at the implications for, and this paper looked at the implications for anti restenosis technologies, you can look at, uh, this is a series of 100 limbs, uh, what percentage of these patients had chronic occlusions. These are long segments of disease below the knee. Uh, multiple tibial arteries are often involved. 
Uh, here just looks at you know, the presence of stenosis versus occlusions. You can see there's a lot of tibial occlusions in patients with CLI. So um, this is what we're facing on, on a regular basis. There's a lot of burden of infrapopliteal disease, long segments, lots of occlusions, and often combined with some above the knee disease. This is the latest update on the, on the task system, and it's, it, they've added a tibial level system, but they really haven't changed very much. It's still a segment by segment approach. So uh, it's really hard for me to know what, what that means when I have multi, multi levels of disease involved. They, they didn't change the above knee system. It's the same as before. They've added this system for tibial disease, uh, but again, the recommendation is that it doesn't really allow you to make clinical decision making. It's probably most useful for comparing how two devices may work in the same lesion, but not really for treatment strategies. So how do you combine this to actually help you decide what to do for a, a patient with CLI? So this is why I think many of us believe we need actually a new scheme which really describes not so much individual lesions, but patterns of disease, so that we can stratify and compare outcomes for different approaches that we use, different treatment strategies, and also to drive clinical trial designs, much more like we understand with coronary disease. Everybody knows, not just the people who treat coronary disease, but even the referring physicians, they understand single, two, three vessel disease, plus or minus bad heart function. Nobody knows what we're talking about when we're talking about these patterns of disease. It's not easy to understand. It's not easy to design trials. It's not easy to compare incomes, uh, outcomes. Uh, and so I think, and incomes. And I think um, that was a careful slip there. So <laughs> the focus on infraringual disease, I think, is important because that's where we have the most complexity. I think the anatomic scheme should really look at the whole path of revascularization from groin to ankle that the operator would define based on the clinical circumstance at hand, based on perhaps an angiosome and whatever the desired circumstance is. That would be the goal of such a system. And we've begun to start to wrestle with this concept. And I'm just going to show you a concept that basically looks a little bit similar to TASC, but it, it, it really talks about grading the femoropopliteal system and then grading a dominant target artery in the tibial system based on a, a range of, of factors, primarily driven by the challenges of endovascular revascularization. And then coming up with some way, and this is just a hypothetical scenario, where you would take these two grades and combine them into a stage. And the stage really estimates the difficulty of achieving total revascularization from groin to ankle, and also the durability of that outcome to some degree. So this is a work in progress, but this is a concept that I think is going to be uh, maturing relatively quickly. Um, we started to try to look at this within our own set of, of patients who had undergone revascularization in our center, uh, 86 consecutive limbs, most of them were diabetics, and we were just looking at the patterns of disease. And for example, just looking at a below knee versus above knee, about 40% had combined disease, uh, about uh, a third were predominantly above knee disease, and about a quarter were predominantly tibial disease. And not surprisingly, the burden of below knee disease had the strongest association with outcomes, particularly in the endovascular intervention group in our series at least. This is just early data that basically just shows that if we look at a predominantly fempop, predominantly tibial, uh, actually there's about a 50-50 uh, breakdown between what patients actually got. Very, very rare to get an amputation in the above knee disease group. They're mostly concentrated in the patients who have the highest burden below the, uh, the knee, and they were, in this case, more seen in the endovascular intervention group. This is not the full staging system, but it gives you some idea of, of how this adds to the idea of just looking at a lesion. We really need to be able to look at the oval global pattern of disease to really understand what we're doing and what's working and where it's working. So I'll end up by saying that I think this is going to be part of what comes to maturity when we uh, finalize or hopefully come out with the next global vascular guideline, which is a joint project from the SVS, the European Society, and the World Federation. Uh, we're expecting this to be finished within this calendar year and to get published in early 2017, and some of these new staging systems will hopefully begin to get suggested as a way to move things forward. I'd be happy to take questions uh, after.